Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Kennett Institute and our panel on reappraising the wild 90s in Russia. In Russia, looking back, I apologize for our delay, but we're just going to go right in without any introductions, uh, except to welcome Blair Rubel back to the Kennett Institute virtual stage. Uh, Blair served as director of the Kennett Institute for 23 years, and we're happy to have him back here to talk about the Kennan Institute's role in the 1990s. Blair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Will, and thank you, Randy, and Victoria, and everybody at the Wilson Center for making this all possible. Um, when Will and Randy invited me to say a few uh, opening remarks, they suggested I talk about what we were up to at the Kennan Institute during those years. And I, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to make a couple of general remarks, but I want to focus on what we thought we had to do to know what was happening uh, in the Soviet Union and then in Russia and Ukraine, uh, because I, I, I think it sheds light on the challenges, uh, not only of Russia in the 1990s, but of our relationship with Russia. And um, I, please indulge me a bit as I make this a, a little bit personal, but then I'll, I'll open it uh, up and make some general observations. Um, I came to the Ken Institute after having been at the SSRC in New York, where I had been uh, in charge of the Soviet program and for a while babysat the uh, Japan and Korea programs. And SSRC had invested heavily in uh, regional studies, and it was also and is a council of representatives of major social science associations. So the SSRC stood at the center of what became uh, a, a kind of war between area studies and the social science disciplines, as the social science disciplines were claiming uh, regional knowledge is insufficiently theoretical and merely descriptive. Uh, and um, this was important because what it meant was my entire time at SSRC was spent thinking about how you go about from the United States studying a different region. Now, Soviet studies had its own additional challenges. Uh, in addition to being confronted by this general retreat uh, from regional specific knowledge, Soviet studies attracted the contempt of other area study specialists who viewed the field increasingly as little more than an extension of the US intelligence and security communities. And uh, what we were trying to do at SSRC, and I'll get to Ken in a moment, was to really give an academic focus on what was happening uh, in the Soviet Union. So I, I looked around and I, I um, saw what other area studies programs and what other area studies enterprises were about. And the US had very robust area studies on Latin America, on Africa, on Asia, Europe. Uh, but there was one major difference. Uh, U.S. Latin American studies, for example, was very robust and had numerous university centers and peer-reviewed journals and a major professional association, but the center of all regional studies on Latin America fundamentally rested in Latin America. This was true with all the regions. Even Chinese studies had important partners in Taiwan and Hong Kong. In this context, Soviet studies in the 1980s had one arm tied behind its back. And this um, created difficulties for understanding what was happening once Perestroika began and what happened after the 1990s. So when I came to the Kennan Institute, I was thinking about how I could use my position as director to nurture meaningful connections between Soviet and US social scientists and uh, humanities scholars. So as the Soviet Union opened up, I saw the need to develop a network of professional colleagues in the Soviet Union and also in the US who could support, inform, critique, and shape each other. I, I think this is important because it was uh, a lot of people involved in, in this enterprise, I wasn't alone, weren't trying to uh, impose a worldview on social scientists in the Soviet Union, but it was important to create a sufficient base of shared concepts and assumptions, a common language that enabled us to talk to one another. Uh, this didn't require agreement, but it did require shared methodologies, concepts, 
and most importantly, sources. Now, all of us at the Ken Institute at the time set out to create a professional environment in which Americans and Soviets, and later Russians, Ukrainians, and others could collaborate on an equal basis. We're trying to ensure that our speaker series had meaningful representation of voices from the region. Our publications included Russian, and Ukrainian, and other scholars. Uh, the Scholars in Residence program brought together people from the region and uh, from the US. And with the eye towards giving a meaningful professional experience in the US for mid-career Russian and Ukrainian scholars who would be able to go home and be our colleagues. Uh, ideally, these activities would have included Europeans and Asians as well, but the problem was, and this becomes a general problem looking into what happened in the 1990s, funders weren't much interested in making these contacts um, multilateral. Uh, funders were either supporting American participation or Russian participation, but really weren't looking towards uh, broadening out the exchange. Now, I'd like to think we largely succeeded in what we we're trying to do, uh, but what do these efforts at trying to integrate uh, US and Russian and Ukrainian and other social science and humanities communities tell us about the broader picture of the 1990s and what we're about to talk about, which was uh, the engagement um, uh, across uh, many different sectors. Well, the record is mixed, but in ways which might offer insights for our discussions today and tomorrow. Let me uh, quickly run through um, what happened in different uh, fields of study, and then I'll wrap up trying to make a couple of larger points. The bridge between American and Russian scholars in this study of Russian language and literature was never very long. And indeed, Americans quickly became integrated into a universal community of Russian language and literature specialists, primarily centered in Russia. This was the model I was talking about in other area studies, and it happened almost immediately in Russian language and lit. The case of economics is perhaps more interesting as economists in some ways had the greatest distance to travel. As late as 1990, there was a subfield of economics devoted to the study of centrally planned economies. And when those economies collapsed, so did the field. By the early 1990s, there was only economics. And economists, no matter where they were, used the same methodologies, the same conceptual frameworks. They may not have agreed, but they were all part of one field. The sort of integration of effort I envision, I think was achieved in the field of history, particularly Russian history and diplomatic history. Russian and American historians publish in the same journals, engage with one another at the same conferences, utilize similar concepts and methodologies, and most important, utilize the same archives as Russian archives have opened up. And here I'd like to make the important point that Russian archives for the most part remain open. Uh, the change is especially important in diplomatic history where the archival record of the late 1990s in both countries is opening up. The situation in sociology and anthropology is a story unto itself and uh, an important one for what it reveals about where we are now. As fieldwork opportunities opened up, American scholars, especially graduate students in both fields, began examining Russia to expand the academic discussions in their own fields that had been too limited by the US experience. Western scholars examining Russia and a new cohort of Russian social scientists better trained in Western theory and methods began to study Russian society in ways that challenged our own social science orthodoxy. This was particularly true in the sociology of health where field work uh, from Russia, in Russia, and work from Russia often expose misplaced assumptions in the American field. Now, as exciting, uh, these exciting areas of research have largely been choked off by the ever-shrinking opportunity for field research in Russia, although Russian scholars continue to make important contributions to our understanding of fields like health and migration. And this shows how uh, there is a bit of an arc from the 1990s to the contemporary period. And, and it was, um, we're, we're not just replaying what happened in the 1990s. 
Then we have the study of politics, which remains by far the most contentious area of research and commentary, and maybe is even more distant today than it was uh, 30 years ago. So the record is mixed. And uh, we're gonna move on and talk about more practical engagement and also what was happening in Russia. But I think it's important to reflect a little bit on how we came to understand what was happening. And uh, the larger point is there's no single path forward, not in scholarship and not in any other area between the 1990s and now. The story is decidedly not one of an opening and a closing and not just in scholarship. Russia is fully integrated in any number of fields in ways it wasn't 30 years ago. We can think about sports and dance and music, the circus. These aren't trivial areas and they demonstrate the complete integration of Russians into a global community. So it also, these kinds of areas suggest that we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about a Russia withdrawing into itself. In some ways it is, but not everywhere. And I, therefore I think it's important to dig more deeply into precisely what is going on. Finally, not only have Russia and the US changed, but the world has changed. Putin's Russia is not the Soviet Union in miniature, and that might be something that will come up for discussion. Moreover, the position of the US in the world is dramatically different. As we look ahead, there's a new agenda driving international and national events that's not the same as the 1990s. Major issues confronting the world today, climate, health, migration, populist nationalism, the cyber revolution, constitute a 21st century agenda that largely did not exist at the start of the 1990s. So to return to where I began, I hope these reflections on the Kennan Institute help frame a larger conversation about what is important in remembering, but also not trying to get too caught up in a past reality, which is not the reality of today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Blair. Uh, always uh, very insightful comments. And thank you very much for joining our panel today. Um, I just want to give a few um, few uh, areas of, of how you can get in contact with us uh, to have our discussion. We will go a little bit over uh, to about 12.15 so that we can get more questions in. But if you have a question, please send it to kennan at wilsoncenter.org or you can use uh, our Facebook page or go to, to Twitter at Kennan Institute. And I know we have a very large audience, uh, a lot of colleagues who are attending and we'll do our best to get to your questions and comments and also try to incorporate your reminiscences into our discussion. But we're gonna begin with our four speakers, uh, all of whom were on the ground in Russia during the 1990s and all have differing perspectives uh, from journalism, law, business, government, and civil society. So I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, our speakers. If you want to learn more about them, uh, you can go to their bios on our event page uh, for today's event. But we're going to begin with Jill Doherty. She is a global fellow at the Kennan Institute and host of our Kennan X podcast. Uh, she served as US Affairs Editor for CNN International, Managing Editor of CNN International Asia Pacific, and CNN's Moscow Bureau Chief and Correspondent. So we're going to start with the subject of journalism in the 1990s. And uh, Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Will. Um, that Actually, I thought that Blair's uh, presentation was very interesting because I was thinking, you know, we all, it's kind of like the movie Rashomon. We all have different views of what happened at that particular time. And it's very hard. I, we have seven minutes to make our opening presentations. So I'll try to be brief. But I come at it from a, kind of a different perspective because at that point, going back to the early 90s, uh, I was not an academic and I still kind of consider myself more a journalist. Uh, even though I teach at Georgetown, I'm still uh, a journalist at heart. And so as I look back, I have a combination of kind of, uh, let's say, an academic overall view of what happened. <clears throat> but also a very personal view, because when I started out 
uh, studying Russian. I actually started the Russian language in high school. And then I was an exchange student in 1969 in Leningrad. And then I went on, as some people I know, uh, US information agency exhibits in the Soviet Union. And then finally, uh, returning for work for, uh, for CNN. So if I were to put on my academic hat, I would say the 90s obviously mean to me the end of the Soviet Union and the beginning, the birth of modern Russia and the first you know, roughly uh, nine years of modern Russia. And I do feel that that period, and even to now, is really a period of duality. And I'll explain that. I have dual views of what happened and the significance. And I think Russia went through a certain duality as well. So 1991, uh, I was assigned as CNN's White House correspondent. And uh, I watched that summer the failed coup of uh, the August coup. I was in DC, as I said, I returned to Moscow briefly during that period. CNN's bureau is located and was at that point on Kutuzovsky Prospect, which is the main drag going down into the center of the city, right across from the, what is called the Russian White House Center of Government, and then near the American Embassy. So there, it was a very interesting place physically and then also there were protests and demonstrations and all sorts of meetings. And I remember the um, euphoria, I think I'd have to say of that period in uh, 1991, um, the, the uh, euphoria of the end of the Soviet Union. And then um, I would say the end, the end of the Soviet Union in December of 1991, I had gone back to the United States at that point. I'm back in my job as kind of the low man on the totem pole at the White House correspondence for CNN. And uh, I had to work Christmas. So Christmas 1991, as we all remember. And there I was on the front lawn of the White House watching the flag coming down in the Kremlin, the Soviet flag, and the beginning of modern Russia. And I must say, um, I cried during that period because it was so very emotional. You know, the country that had really fascinated me um, and uh, the language of which I had studied since I was a teenager was all of a sudden no longer there. And that concept was very difficult for me, and obviously for Russians and Soviet citizens, even more to understand. So that duality, I guess I looked at it from the perspective of an American, as I was uh, you know, happy, I was thrilled, I was hopeful, but this was kind of a Jeffersonian democracy view of what was going on. It was more theoretical, which was summed up in, of course, they're gonna join the world, and they will see it uh, the way that my world at that point, the United States saw it, which is democracy writ large. Uh, but as I returned to the Soviet Union, and then I should say back to Russia on temporary assignment throughout the 1990s, I went back and forth a lot. And then finally in 97 as bureau chief, I saw the reality on the ground. I saw old women selling everything that they had on the street. I saw the little store in front of CNN, which now is a Porsche dealer, but at that point was a little store and it had virtually nothing in it. Um, I saw very little on the shelves in general. I saw people, you know, hunger. And um, I also saw, I think the chaos of that early period. And so this idea that you know, Yeltsin as a Democrat had changed things and was going to restore, um, you know, Russia's understanding of, of uh, its, even its early period of pre-revolutionary became very confused. The chaos, and especially as a journalist, I, the talk about the duality, I was uh, enthusiastic about the opening of democracy in the media. People could say what they want, et cetera. But then I could see all of the people uh, who were like taking over the media. 
if you look at um, Chubais, uh, uh, Vladimir uh, Patanin taking over what he owned, Izvestia, I looked up the list, Izvestia, Komsomolskaya Pravda, and RTR. So there was a shift in that. And I think, um, I guess I'm getting close to my time, but you know, some of the statistics are shocking. So 40% of the population had a sharp drop in income. 20% of the population was existing on 50 to $100 a month. 40% were living on $50 or less. It's almost unimaginable. And I think as I look at that, that period, I think of the end of the Soviet Union, as much as it brought many good things to Russians, the entire society was built upon the structure of the Communist Party. So that if you look at it theoretically, that was one thing, but practically people lived their lives, their kids went on vacation, they uh, bought you know, meat from their factories because of that system that existed. And when it was gone, it was almost like losing the skeleton in a body, things fell apart. And what was there to help them? Very little. There was a lot of economic chaos. So I would say my conclusions, and there are many of them, but I would say my conclusion is that this was, it's very important that I, as a Westerner, as an American, understand that this was not just an historical um, fact. It was lives of people and that the end of the Soviet Union, to my mind, kind of continues. I believe that some of the lessons, some of the things that people went through affect people to this day. And I'll just end with this um, talk about duality, a conversation that I had with a Kremlin official in the, um, it was just about 2000, so very early Putin. Um, so I'm kind of getting out of the 90s, but I asked him, so, do you really believe in democracy? And he said, of course we do, Jill. What are you talking about? And I said, well, I see things that don't feel very democratic to me. And he said, you know, um, we do. And I think that Russia eventually will be a democratic country in the mode of Western countries, but not just yet. And he said, if you let Russians vote, the way they probably would vote now, they'll bring back the communists. So that would be very bad for Russia. Ergo, we can't let that happen. So we can't quite open up yet. And that to me is one of the dilemmas of Russia right now. This fear that if it were really to open up and be whatever it is, whatever form of democracy, Russian democracy it will be, the fear that that would be chaos and the country would fall apart. And that to me is a problem. It's a problem in the mentality and it's a problem now because that has become part of the structure of the government. But I'll leave it at there, plenty to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, again, if you want to look at the full bios of our speakers, you can go to our page. Um, and if you want to ask questions for our panelists, you can send them by email to Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, uh, to our Twitter account uh, at Kenan Institute, or right on our Facebook page. And again, we'll be going a little bit over because we had a late start. Um, next, I'm going to turn to Ambassador Kenneth Yalowitz. Uh, Ambassador Yalowitz is also a global fellow at the Kenan Institute. He served as a U.S. Foreign Service officer for 36 years, including since uh, ambassador to Belarus and to Georgia, and also two tours uh, in Moscow. So, Ambassador Yalowitz, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, listening to both Blair and Jill, terrific. A wonderful, wonderful start, and I hope I can measure up. Um, <clears throat> we arrived in Moscow on our second tour about a day and a half after the failed coup uh, in August of 1991. Uh, our first tour uh, was in the Soviet Union, 1975 to seven. So I experienced, you know, the Cold War, you know, in place uh, in Moscow. 
And obviously it was both very, very interesting and very, very difficult time to be there. And I agreed to come back to uh, Moscow in 1991, largely because of the uh, Gorbachev reforms uh, and the uh, wanting to be on the ground, you know, to see this process of change, uh, which many of us, you know, thought we would probably never see before. And the day after we arrived, my wife, Judy, who's sitting next to me, and uh, another officer, Louis Sell from the embassy, walked across the street from the uh, embassy compound to the uh, Russian White House area, uh, where there was a celebration. The then mayor of Moscow had a celebration of the defeat of the coup. And the three of us walked around, and I think the only word I can use is we were dumbfounded. Uh, because nary a Soviet flag to be seen, Russian flags everywhere. But even more so, what struck us were the posters, the pictures, people talking about uh, all of their grievances, you know, whether it was Nagorno-Karabakh or Georgia, um, all the various ethnic groups that had uh, you know, uh, territorial, ethnic territorial issues were there with placards showing you know, atrocities and all these things. And we looked at each other, the three Americans, and our first impulse is the KGB is going to be here in five minutes you know, to break this whole thing up because that's what we remembered uh, from the 70s. But that you know, never happened. And I think it was at that moment that we recognized you know, that something very profound uh, was going on. And then that period from August to December, as I say, I was at the embassy, I was the um, economic minister of the first year and the second year, uh, the acting deputy chief of mission uh, under uh, Jim Collins, who was the charge and then later ambassador. Um, but what I witnessed, um, you know, was sort of the, the slow shift of power away from Soviet institutions of governance to Russia. And just to give you one example, uh, I went to see the Russian economics minister uh, to talk about the visit of the deputy defense secretary who was going to be talking about conversion. We were already talking about helping all the large Russian military industrial complex convert to civilian production. And I, I came in and I sat down with the minister and I explained, you know, what we were doing. And he asked me, you know, who I was contacting. And I told him and he said, don't bother to contact the Soviet ministers any longer. If you want to get anything done on this visit, talk to us, you know, talk to the Russian ministers. And that was something, you know, that was very, very clear to me. It was the sort of the shift uh, in power. And you saw it also with Gorbachev and Yeltsin, how power shifted uh, increasingly, uh, you know, from Yeltsin. And then, of course, uh, December 25th happened. And, uh, you know, like Jill, uh, we, you know, went and saw the lowering of the Soviet flag over the Kremlin, something that was remarkable. I can't say that I cried, but it was certainly, you know, very historic, um, you know, to see that. So the end of the USSR came at the end of December. And uh, like Jill has described, you know, the duality, it was certainly something, you know, that we witnessed. Uh, there was both a great sense of anticipation, expectation, but also great uncertainty. Uh, and what, I, what struck me in those first few months uh, was the great interest in various occult and exotic religions People were simply experimenting, you know, looking at all the things that had been Vasproshini before, you know, that, that were sort of uh, uh, shielded off from them. There was a tremendous openness, of, you know, compared to when we were there in the mid 70s. People sought us out, you know, we, we could get meetings with almost anybody. Everybody wanted to talk about, you know, what, what is this new economic system? Uh, you know, where, you know where, where, where are we going from here? And the single most important factor that I can remember was that the fear was gone. Uh, 
uh, people were willing to talk with us. I'm talking about official Americans. They weren't afraid, you know, any longer. And as economic minister, you know, I dealt quite a bit with the uh, Gaidar team, uh, Peter Avin and, and Yegor Gaidar. And I can remember in meetings, you know, with them, uh, them talking about their being kamikazes. They knew that they had a short period of time uh, to implement reforms, uh, you know, to free prices, to free trade, uh, you know, to let the ruble, you know, begin to float and to begin this incredibly complex process of de-Sovietization, you know, of the economy. And I can remember them saying that they thought they had, you know, eight to 10 months, which is probably, uh, you know, correct. Uh, there was great enthusiasm about privatization. I can remember uh, we had these, uh, you know, auctions. Uh, everyone was given a certificate, you know, to, you know, to buy shares in an industry. Great optimism uh, and probably not fully understanding all the complexities uh, of what, you know, the sort of de-Sovietization of, uh, of the Soviet economy was all about. And I remember again uh, in May of 1992, uh, the U.S. offered a $20 billion package of economic assistance, you know, to Russia. And Mr. Yeltsin seemed to think, you know, that a Brinks truck was going to drive up into the Kremlin and drop off $20 billion in cash, when in fact it was, you know, a lot of technical assistance, uh, debt, you know, forgiveness, things of that nature, and it wasn't going to be sort of direct budget assistance with lots of money. And he was, you know, very confused uh, about this to a point that the uh, president of the New York Federal Reserve, who uh, had gotten, you know, very close to Yeltsin as an advisor, uh, came to Moscow to explain to him what exactly uh, this was all going to be about. It was also, you know, in these first, you know, eight to 10 months, and Jill has already described it, that we saw the real troubles, you know, beginning, you know, to, uh, to set in. Uh, the economic devastation for many, many people, uh, people selling all their possessions, you know, in the parks on the weekend, uh, the ruble falling and the almost hyperinflation. And I can remember how this was personalized because people were telling us the one thing that they had saved up for was burial accounts. And they were just wiped out, you know, by the by the drop in the value of the ruble. And, you know, how, how personal that was, you know, that this was so important to them. Foreign policy wise, you know, now there were 15 different countries where before there had been one. Uh, and then we saw, you know, the beginnings of the Chechen, you know, wars, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the war began, Georgia, the separatist struggles, and also Moldova. And uh, uh, Minister Kozarev is going to speak, but I can remember, you know, talking with colleagues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who all of a sudden were dealing with, you know, areas of the former Soviet Union, which were now foreign countries. And you know how hard it was, you know, for these countries, the new countries, to establish diplomatic services and all the other institutions, you know, of you know of government. And a very important point is, I think that in this period, when we all hoped to see sort of the beginnings of a middle class, you know, based on private property, uh, the privatization. What we saw was because of this loss of you know, the economy so badly and also the loss of status of so many institutniki you know, and other government officials that the people we had hoped would become sort of the, the core, uh, the essence of a new middle class really soured on the ideas of reform and, you know, and democracy. Uh, then also, you know, Mr. Yeltsin, you know, the, the leadership was erratic. I don't have to go into that. We saw also this growing sense of loss of status from the fall of the USSR, the beginnings of the feelings, you know, that the West had taken advantage, and also the ideological vacuum. Soviet ideology was gone, and what was now to replace it? What were the new countries, and what were, the, what were going to be the narratives uh, that now took the place of, of Soviet ideology. Uh, 
And indeed, by the end of 1992, uh, Yeltsin had replaced Gaidar with Chairman Mirden. And I would have to say, you know, that I think a lot of the reform drive, you know, was blunted after that. The opposition then, of course, increased between Yeltsin and the Duma, leading to the, uh, the violence, the face-off, uh, one year later uh, outside, of the, uh, outside of the White House. And just to finish, uh, I think, you know, we left in the summer of 1993, but, you know, I think a lot of the trends that we saw before we left, you know, sort of really uh, captured what happened in the 1990s, the erraticism, you know, of Yeltsin, uh, the period of deke capitalism, you know, the wild capitalism, uh, the gangs, the shootings, you know, the murders of people, uh, the beginnings of the development of the oligarchs, uh, the capture of the privatization process, you know, by uh, formerly very well placed, uh, you know, uh, leaders, you know, usually uh, vice ministers or plant directors, but they were able to capture uh, so much of the privatization process. And certainly uh, the name of capitalism, uh, you know, was, was uh, muddied uh, uh, very, very much, you know, during that period. And then also, of course, you have the uh, question of the opposition to NATO expansion, the issues of the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, all of these things I said, you know, set the stage for, you know, the emergence uh, at the end of the decade and early into the 2000s uh, of Mr. Putin. So to conclude, I would say clearly, um, you know, uh, on, on our part, probably over optimism, perhaps, uh, not a strong enough sense of the tremendous, uh, you know, uh, tectonic shifts, you know, that had happened. And on the Russian side, uh, I think, you know, what emerged to me, uh, you know, was sort of the, the Eurasia versus Western uh, mindset, you know, that, that sort of classic struggle, you know, about where Russia is and to where it belongs. Uh, really began to play out. And I think the Eurasian, you know, side of it uh, certainly became stronger. So let me finish there. Thanks very much, uh, Ken. Uh, we will, just, just a reminder for our audience, we will run a, about 15 minutes over, but you can send your questions at Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, to Twitter at Kenan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Uh, next, we have uh, Randy Bregman, Randy is Senior Counsel of Denton's uh, Federal Regulation and Compliance Practice. He has focused his practice of East, on Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union for more than 25 years and regularly still advises corporations and investors on how to invest in Russia and the former Soviet space. So Randy's going to talk about uh, the, his, his experiences in Russia, focusing on the business community and the legal community. Randy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Will. I first want to start off making a point about CNN that Jill didn't make. CNN was a critical source of information for not only foreigners living in Moscow, but for Russians. Most of the people that I work with listen regularly to CNN. And during the constitutional crisis in 1993, all the Russian uh, news agencies were, were closed. And everybody got their news. Russians, Americans, Brits, everybody got their news from CNN. And in fact, as I recall, there was a CNN reporter uh, embedded, a uh, word later became more popular, in the, in the White House during that time. So CNN was not just observing, was an active participant in the developments in the 90s. Um, when I think about practicing law in Moscow in the 1990s, I recall an interview I saw on TV years before with the US Supreme Court Justice uh, William O. Douglas and his wife. Uh, just, uh, uh, Douglas was uh, obviously in the Supreme Court. His wife was then a law student. And the interviewer asked him whether he thought being a law student or being a Supreme Court Justice was more difficult. And he said, there's no question, it's much harder to be a law student you have to know, learn the law and know the law. I can make it up as I go along. And in fact, he did. But that's kind of how I felt when I went to, when I'm, we moved to Moscow at the end of 1991. 
and when that infamous or famous flag was lowered, that we had to make up law as we went along. Uh, there was Soviet law, some of which was incorporated into Russian law, but it was not really applicable to what was going on. Uh, the market economy was starting, our clients were getting into business relationships, and they needed a legal framework for it, and the legal framework that in Soviet law just didn't apply. Uh, in fact, we ended up imagining what Russian contract law should look like or what Russian property law should look like. The basic foundations of commercial law had changed from those of a state planned economy to a free market economy. Contract law in the Soviet Union was more or less implementing state, a state plan and it was state orders to state entities. Contract law in a market economy is fundamentally the meeting of minds of private individuals, private parties. Property law, where most property was state owned in the Soviet Union and the Soviet property codes codified that uh, fact. But people needed to have more uh, ability to own property, which just didn't exist in the law. They needed to be guaranteed rights so that they could build on property and know they could use it for uh, a, a long period of time. There was also no record of title. So there are constant questions of who owned what and what you could do with it. Corporate law, all the entities in the Soviet Union were almost all state entities. They're owned by the state and run by the state. Corporations in a private economy have shareholders, have boards of directors, all brand new concepts. Uh, but it was happening, people who were forming companies. So what sources did we use to do this imagination of what law should be? Uh, well, we used Soviet law. Uh, as I've noted, it's mostly not applicable, but we tried very in various ways to retrofit it, mostly awkward ways to retrofit it, and it didn't work. There were some good laws, helpful laws that were enacted during uh, the Gorbachev uh, perestroika era. And one in particular was the joint venture law, fairly short law that covered everything that had to do with foreign investment, everything from ownership to employment. And obviously it wasn't very specific, but at least it provided some framework. Uh, but what, one of the things we uh, experienced was that uh, Russians, mostly government, government officials, still relied on the existing Russian law. We had a case where one of our clients was trying to export oil from Russia, and there was some, a great deal of uncertainty about what the tariff should be. There were conflicting regulations, some were higher and some were lower. So we went to the court and prepared to argue that the lower one should apply, of course. Much to our surprise, the customs official there uh, gave us a lower tariff even than we had imagined. So I asked him, how did he come up with that rate? And he said, he pulled out a book, which was a 1974 Soviet customs uh, tariff book. And, and he explained, he said, I can't follow all these changes anymore. So I'm going to just use the book that I'm most familiar that I started with when I uh, started being a customs official. Of course, we were quite happy with, with the result. But it's an example of the sort of lingering effect of uh, Soviet law. The second uh, source of a law was foreign law. Um, we used laws of New York, laws of England and Wales, laws of other countries in documents. Um, the, there were two problems with that. One was it was we had to explain what the law was and what it meant to part not only to our client, but to the adverse party, which was a little bit of an awkward situation. Uh, and the second concern was that uh, if there was any, the Russian courts wouldn't enforce any foreign arbitral awards under the law if they felt it was inconsistent with whatever existed for Russian law. So it, it, for, for at least the years in the early nineties, it wasn't a, set, a really safe, source to use. The other was Russian law. And 
who was emerging uh, from 1992 onward uh, to suit the new market economy. Uh, Russian law is based primarily on codes and the codes take a long time to revise. Uh, they're done very carefully and very, very thoroughly, thoroughly. So in the meantime, uh, they passed certain laws and, they, and there were presidential de decrees. Uh, the new laws were often ambiguous, not clearly written, not really understood by the drafters. Uh, I remember one experience where uh, we, we had put together a group of people to review uh, a draft bankruptcy law that had been prepared by Boris Fyodorov. Some of you may know him, and he later became the Minister of Finance. Um, and uh, he, we, he gave us the law, it was in English, and one of the lawyers said, well, why do, could you also give us the original in Russian? He said, you have the original. And he said, no, this is in English. He said, that's the original. I was asked to write a bankruptcy law. I was sent to a, a dach outside of Moscow. And all I had was a Norwegian bankruptcy code and a US bankruptcy code. So I kind of put them together and created the Russian bankruptcy code in English. Um, in, the, in the gaps in the law, uh, the, the President Yeltsin issued regular decrees uh, to, to fill these gaps, the gaps between Russian and Soviet law and the gaps in daily uh, business activity. Uh, we had an experience with a, a decree on converting rubles to hard currency uh, that was a couple pages long. And it, 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 if you read it in a certain way, it would make it very difficult for our client to make these conversions. So one of my colleagues, was a professor at Moscow State University. And she said she knew the person uh, who was working with Yeltsin drafting these decrees. And not only did she know him, but he was a former student. So she called him up and said, Sergei, or she used a diminutive form of the word to show her, her rank above him. Uh, we've been reading this law and currency conversion and we don't think, we think you made a mistake. And he apologized profusely to his professor and said, I'm writing these night and day. I can't always think of them through. What are your suggestions? So she suggested a form of the decree that would allow us to do the currency conversion very quickly. Two days later, the decree was reissued with her comments in it, but not sourced to her. Um, finally, the courts. Um, this was and still is a problem in, in uh, Russian business. The judges uh, were clearly at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union were not trained in Russian law and had no understanding at all of uh, uh, Western concepts of, of uh, capitalism and, and private enterprise. Uh, they, uh, and the, uh, they weren't used to dealing with cases between two private parties. Um, they were used to dealing with cases having to do with enforcement of a state plan by, uh, by the state. And so they were completely untrained for what they uh, had to do in the early 90s. And I won't mention the problem, of course, of corruption, which we can probably talk about later uh, in our discussion. So uh, thanks, Will. And Great. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, we will go to our last speaker, but a reminder, we are, we are already getting questions and we will have plenty of time to discuss them, but you can send the questions to Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, our email account, to Twitter at Kenan Institute, or right on our Facebook page. Uh, we now turn to Andrew Cushins. Uh, he is the president of the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, but he is uh, served in various capacities during the 1990s. Uh, I still remember uh, dropping by for nice cups of tea and solving uh, the world's problems and Russia's problems over uh, an hour when I stopped by the MacArthur Foundation. But Andrew was uh, instrumental in dealing with issues of civil society 
So Andrew, floor is yours. Uh, oh, sorry. Thanks very much, Will, and the Kennedy Institute. Good morning, Washington, or I guess for people from around the world. It's 9 p.m. here in Bishkek. Um, so uh, I have a strong sense of duality about what was happening in the 1990s, uh, kind of along the lines of, of what uh, Jill's remarks. You know, at this point in the panel, you know, everything has been said except by me. So, uh, uh, but the duality is very, is very important. On the one hand, there was tremendous hope and excitement with the collapse of the Soviet Union. On the other hand, my, as an analyst, as an academic, as someone studying the Soviet Union, uh, my best case scenario for this so-called transition would that it would take at least a couple of generations before we would be in a position to judge and that it was going to, it was going to be extremely difficult, extremely difficult. Um, and I think that uh, both on the American side and the Russian side, um, there were uh, ex there, there were excessive expectations, at least at least from the start. And I'll talk about that a little, little bit later. The other aspect of duality from my side is that, do I talk about what I was doing or do I talk about what I was thinking? <laughs> um, you know, I bookended the 1990s. I was in California for uh, 89 to 93 in the Bay Area uh, as executive director of the Berkeley Stanford program in Soviet studies then later post-Soviet studies. And then I went into a, a, a practitioner role with the MacArthur Foundation, running a program to support scientists and researchers in the former Soviet Union, civil society activists. And then I returned back to, uh, uh, to Stanford um, for, the, for the end of the decade. At any rate, I guess I decided, at least for the opening remarks, to focus a little bit more on what I was thinking uh, and how I saw, how I saw things. Um, you know, first, maybe I'll say something in defense of Sovietology, uh, which got such so much heat for so-called not predicting the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, there were a lot of good reasons not to predict the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and in fact, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, certainly when he came to power in 1985, was uh, had no, no plan uh, that he would ultimately end up trying to implement these very, very, very radical economic and political reforms towards the end. And what he was driven by, and this is, uh, I think, take really, uh, I rely a lot on Yegor Gaidar's book, Collapse of Empire, a very, very good book. Um, they were going bankrupt. Um, the price of oil crashed in 1986, and uh, the price of, uh, of wheat, their main import, went up dramatically. It was like a scissors crisis for us. Uh, are so old Soviet experts. Um, they were going bankrupt and they went bankrupt. And, and to me, that is, the, that is the fundamental driver of the collapse of the, so the Soviet Union. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, I just finished my dissertation in 1992. I'd written on uh, Sino-Soviet relations. I was one of the very few people in my generation to actually write about international relations because everybody was, so many people were very, very excited about the reforms that were going on and they turned to domestic topics. Uh, you know, I felt like kind of a fossil <laughs> taking on that, taking on that topic. And then if people were taking on, on topics on international relations, most people in my generation were uh, uh, in, the, in the effort to trash uh, the, the realist school in international relations. Which actually, I think the realist school has a lot of has a lot to say that's very very useful, and I still I still do, you know. But there's a lot to be said for constructivism. There's a lot to be said for liberal internationals, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem I think with dissertation with exercise is that one is forced to come up with single source, single factor explanations for extremely complex phenomena. Um, but I don't won't go I won't go into that. So um, I'll pepper this with a few kind of uh, uh, thoughts or quotes. When I think of the 1990s for Russia, I, I think of uh, Albert King, the late great blues man, uh, who sang, if, I, if it weren't for bad luck, I wouldn't have no luck at all. Um, there were so many bad things happening uh, 
in Russia and its other sibling state, states, so to speak, um, that it just, it seemed like a, an, almost an endless uh, avalanche of bad news uh, with some, uh, and I, as I was thinking about my remarks today, I think that the 1990s for Russia and its post-Soviet siblings were, they were kind of doomed from the start. And it starts with, it starts with the economy, the Soviet economic legacy. For 74 years in the Soviet Union, decisions about economic allocations of building enterprises, where people work, where people live, uh, infrastructure, uh, enterprises, et cetera, were made under non-market conditions. And then suddenly, wham, January 1st, 1992, they, they, you know, they entered the so-called shock therapy with, of, you know, of liberal reforms, marketization, private privatization, um, et cetera. Uh, it was, I mean, if you, if you thought it, if you thought, if you were thinking about it and you knew anything about economics, I mean, how could you be optimistic that this is going to go well, really? Um, and I, I rely a lot on this sort of the work of uh, Cliff Gaddy, very close, close with and good, good friend uh, for many, many years. Um, but then on top of that, the Soviet system, you know, the, the undervalued worst, worthless consumer goods and, uh, uh, and they overvalue, and excuse me, they overvalued worthless cons consumer goods, and they undervalued natural resources like gas, uh, oil, minerals, etc., that actually had real value uh, in the international marketplace. So the 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 system was intrinsically um, just really really screwed up, and suddenly it it was it could function to some extent in isolate uh, in more isolation from the global economy. But once it's opened up into the global economy, then you, it all is revealed, all of the dysfunction, all of the non-competitiveness, all of the problems with pricing that existed. And you have the, uh, uh, the economic catastrophe that resulted. Um, and of course, there are going to be political repercussions for that. <laughs> of course, there are going to be international repercussions, repercussions for that. Um, you know, when Gaidar and company came to power, uh, I, to kind of paraphrase Steve Solnick, uh, the state had already been stolen. Um, the state was already bankrupt. Uh, it was at, at least, as uh, um, Ambassador Yalowitz was saying, Karen, that, you know, Gaidar said it was worse than I expected. I mean, there was really nothing in the cupboard. Uh, and so, there's this huge debate about, um, you know, well, what about the advice that was provided to, you know, to the reformers and what the reformers did? I think that 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 whole debate is a is well, that's a it's a waste of trees, uh, frankly, uh, because I think a lot of what happened was just dialed into uh, from what had happened in the past and this Soviet legacy. It was going to be bad, and it was going to be bad, especially as long as oil prices were low. Oil prices were low from 1986 to 19, 1999, 2000. So Gorbachev and Yeltsin were unlucky. Mr. Putin and Mr. Brezhnev, they were quite lucky, right? Uh, we knew about the weaknesses of the Soviet economy, you know, back in the 1960s, and the Soviets knew it themselves as well. Uh, there was the, you know, Mr. Kasigan had a plan for reform. Kasigan reforms, well, they got completely watered down. And then the oil price and, and, so, and Soviet oil production takes off in the 1970s, and they didn't have to think about reform. But that just postponed the inevitable. Uh, and it hit hard, and it was, a, it was a crash. So you think of that, they went belly up in 1991, and they went belly up again in 1998. To me, those are the two most salient facts of the 1990s. This country went bankrupt twice in one decade, okay? And along with that, you had the collapse of empire in 1991, which echoes the collapse of empire in a way that took place in 19, 1917. And unfortunately, both of these events, the collapse of empire also entailed the collapse of state power. Uh, and with that, at the same time, were the, the only major attempts at democratization in Russia in the 20th century. And they happen to coincide at the time of economic devastation and collapse of state power and loss of empire. <laughs> so that is only going to reinforce 
all of the, uh, the, the proclivities and inclinations Russians tend to have anyway, that uh, democracy is chaos uh, and economic deprivation, and that sets up a perfect, perfect scenario for, uh, for Mr. Yeltsin's successor, Mr. Putin, and what happened in the 2000s you know, to, this, to this day. So to me, you know, I, I said to Ken, I'm going to say something about the Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubs had not won a pennant since 1908, and they a World Series, and they finally, after 108 years, they won one in 2016. 108 years. They had a bad 20th century. Russia had a bad 20th century. And for Americans, fortunately, we cannot even conceive of what this is like to experience a collapse of your country, collapse of everything you believe in. Um, and it had happened twice in Russia in one century. So, you know, that's, that's a lot, a lot to take on. Um, so yes, it was a brutal decade, uh, but I think it was actually, to a large extent, you know, you can't predict the details, but I think the structure of the situation would lead one to expect that there's gonna be tremendous economic devastation and, and difficulties. I don't care who was in power or what they were, what, what, what reforms they were trying to do. The legacy was that heavy to me. But, you know, Mr. Yeltsin in October of, uh, of 1991, he's a politician, okay? And he's on the rise. He, he makes a major speech and he says, look, I know things are really difficult right now, but in six to nine months, I think that, you know, we're gonna be okay. Well, you know, look, the Soviet Union, uh, from the Bolsheviks onward, had been talking about the glorious communist future. You can't, you know, he couldn't talk about, well, things are really going to suck for about 10 years at least, if we're lucky, and then maybe they'll start to start to get better or something along those lines. He's a politician. You can't do that. So I can understand why, why he and his team would take that approach. But I think, as, uh, as Ken said, Mr. Gaidar was very clear about that. They knew that they were going to be out of power within a year. And that is exactly exactly what happened because the reforms that they were gonna do were gonna lead to a lot of dislocation and difficulty, trauma, people losing their life savings. Now on the US, on our, on our part, I think that we could have been a little, little more insightful uh, in, in curbing our enthusiasm at just how, how uh, easily and quick this transition could happen. Um, you know, even at that time, I really saw this as a, as a very, very long haul, best case scenario, hard ups and downs. But we got very, very tied into the person, the, uh, the personality of Boris Yeltsin and the reformers. And the problem with that is that, uh, you know, if you know that there's going to be economic difficulties, these guys are going to have political problems. And then who's to blame? Kotovinovat, right? And it's good. They're going to blame. They're going to blame the reformers. They're going to blame the Americans. They're going to blame those that provided the advice, even though the advice that we were we were providing was basically, I think, the right thing to do. Um, but you know, you were in a kind of a between a rock and a hard rock and a hard place. And that kind of takes me to the other point I want to make about U.S.-Russia relations. I think it was a uh, a case of a complete and total mismatch. The Russians lost their empire. They went from one day they're a superpower, the next day they're a recipient of humanitarian aid. Simultaneously, Washington and the United States, we were on a unipolar run that seemed to have no end. Then we had the dot-com boom later in the 1990s. You know, our poop did not stink, so to speak. Uh, we looked at it that way. And uh, it was just a very, very difficult structural, structural situation to kind of, from a, a, especially from a psychological standpoint. Uh, and this kind of gets to me like, what, why has the US-Russia relationship been so troubled over these 30 years? And, and you know, every presidency that comes in, starting with the Clinton administration, they wanna basically have some kind of, they wanna engage Russia, they wanna improve things, that things get off to a reasonable start and it ends in a catastrophe. And with the Clinton administration, of course, it was the, uh, the, the 1998 uh, um, financial collapse and then the Russian reaction to our war in Serbia, where the Russians finally they realized that, wow, we can't do anything about this. That war never would have happened in the Cold War because there would have been more restraint on both sides. The United States would not have unilaterally 
and NATO started bombing, bombing Belgrade. It wouldn't have happened, but it did in 1999. And that was a very, very, very dark, I think, realization for Russian foreign policy uh, thinkers and policymakers. Um, there, I think there on both sides, there was massive mutual disappointment. Um, you know, my uh, a good friend and uh, former colleague at Georgetown, Angela Stent, wrote a, has written a terrific book uh, on U.S.-Russia relations. I think the the uh, after the McFall Goldgeier book in about 2001, 2002, I think those are the two best books on the relationship that have been written in the last 30 years. But, you know, every administration comes in, they want to make it better, but it ends in catastrophe. It happens three times. Why? 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 What's the problem? And I think it gets back to actually, in a way, it's not quite the right metaphor, but the original sin. And it, the original sin was ex excessive expectations on both sides, or just different expectations. I think the Russians, the Russians thought, okay, the United States is not going to take advantage of us during a time of, during a time of geopolitical difficulty, or a smooth naivremia, a time of troubles. International relations just don't work that way. That's not, that's not the operational code of great powers. That's not how they behave typically. Not just the United States, any great power. Um, that's, you know, <laughs> so the Russians were gonna experience us doing things where we, they said we didn't take their, their interests into account and we didn't, you know, but we could do them. So that's the way it was, too bad. And on our part, you know, our, the, the, our expectation in the bargain is that the Russians were going to make a transition to being a liberal market democracy. And, well, that project didn't go that well. Um, it could have gone a lot worse. Uh, Steve Kotkin wrote a very good book in 2001, 2000 about Armageddon diverted. I mean, there were a lot worse scenarios than what happened in the 1990s. And there were a lot of positive things that did happen in the 1990s. But overall, um, you know, that project has not been a great success. Uh, so <clears throat> let me, since we've been talking so long, we've got a lot of people there on the line with questions. Uh, let me just go back to one anecdote um, that uh, I remember, remember meeting uh, with several other so-called Russia experts with uh, then uh, chief of the uh, general staff, Mike Mullen, in 2007. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was just a, kind of a large think session about, you know, where's Russia going? What's the deal? And he started it off by sharing an anecdote. And I think it's a good one. So he was uh, uh, on a mission, not a mission, but he was on a visit to Severodinsk, to the naval base in 1992. 1992 near the Arctic Circle, a major naval base, submarine base. And uh, uh, one night at the kind of the end of the visit, it was a very, very positive visit. And this night they're doing what we often did in Russia was we are drinking vodka, we are singing songs, we are dancing, we are having fun until the sun comes up or actually the sun never quite went down. It was in June and by about four or five in the morning, everyone's really tired. And he's, he's sitting, he finds himself sitting next to this uh, babushka, older woman, and she looks at him and says to the effect of, we'll be back, we'll be back, i.e. Russia will be back. Russia is not going to go away. It's had difficulties before, and it's, gonna, it's going to survive, and it did come back, and that's another story. So... Thanks for letting me share a few thoughts and uh, let's go, uh, let's move on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy. Um, so we, we've kind of gone over a variety of different areas and, and specific policies. I wanna get back to what Blair talked at the beginning and trying to integrate Russians into the network, into international networks. And I know that Jill would have done that for journalism. Obviously, Randy would have done that for law and business. And so to what extent did the 1990s succeed? Because Blair mentions that we succeed, that, that on a certain level, uh, we have noted successes in terms of Russia integrating into the world. 
So for Randy, Jill, and anyone else who wants to applaud, uh, to, to, to step in, um, to what extent did, despite all the problems that we've talked about, did, we, did, did, did the US policy succeed in integrating uh, Russia into global networks? Uh, or did Russia fail, or, or, or did our policy fail to do that? So I'll leave it up to um, Jill and then Randy. Okay, well, um, you know, I have to take your question is, what did the United States do? <laughs> you know, what policy actually helped to integrate? And I'd have to say, you know, I, from my viewpoint, exchanges were very, very important. Having people come to the United States, having students come to the United States, um, even, you know, members of the government, et cetera, there was a lot more back and forth and openness. And that was institutionalized with exchange programs, et cetera. As I mentioned, I was an exchange student and I saw what it did, gave me a career. And it also exposed me to what was going on in the Soviet Union. So I'm a I, you know, I'm prejudiced because I'm a big fan of exchanges, but I do think that human contact was very, very important. The, and then I won't get into the areas that my colleagues have, but I will say, and this really began at the end, yeah, let's say the mid to the end of the 90s, uh, the internet. You know, I had my first uh, email address when I was in Moscow. And I th when I look at the students, that, that I teach right now and this course on the Putin generation, these young people who've grown up, and I know it's Putin, but it began in the 1990s. The impact of the internet and the, the ability of people to travel, and I think the internet are, from my perspective, have been huge in terms of bringing Russians into the mainstream. Right now, Russian young people are totally part of the world, culturally, uh, travel, intellectually. And it's not just kids in the big cities. It is spread throughout Russia. So those you know, would be two. That, the internet was not US policy, something that the United States basically can be, you know, created. But, um, but those are two things that I think were extremely inter important. But we did create it, actually, as a DARPA project. Yeah, I'm saying, we did. <laughs> I, I know, we I'm, did kind of, I'm joking. It, but we didn't, yeah, we didn't do that I as did. dealing with Russia. Randy and then Blair wants to weigh in as well. I agree with you, Joe. I think the ability to travel Everyone. would... Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. The ability to travel outside of Russia was critical and then something that virtually didn't exist in, in the Soviet Union. And I think the internet was clearly important. I had my own sort of personal experience of this working in reverse during 9-11. I was in an office building in DC, halfway between the Capitol and the White House. We, we, were, we had tanks all around us. Our telephone system was shut off on and off. Uh, we had trouble with the internet. And the, the way I found out what was happening in Washington, D.C. was my colleagues in Moscow would call me every 15 minutes to tell me what they had seen about 9-11 on the Internet, uh, which uh, in, in learning about what was going on was critically important, but seeing the bigger picture of uh, the way communications work. Um, in law and business, I think it was a, a, a way, not with formal exchanges, but naturally that uh, Russians were integrated into their own economy and, and the, the global economy. And uh, in our law firm, we hired Russian lawyers before we hired uh, Western lawyers. So most of our competitors did also. So Russian lawyers got the experience of working with international law firms on international, that is global uh, issues, uh, direct and firsthand, and they were paid for it. The same happened with business, in fact, even faster, that very soon American businesses and joint ventures learned that it was critically important to have Russians be not only on the staff, but in the leadership, because the Russians knew how to deal with Russian authorities, with Russian culture. Uh, so I think law and business, I, I take credit from my sectors, 
uh, played a big role in the uh, integration of Russians uh, into their own society and into the world. Blair, and then everyone else wants to weigh in as well. So Blair, Ken, and Andy. Well, I remember George Kennan once said to me, when you hear two contradictory statements about Russia, always assume that both are true. And that's the duality that everybody's been talking about. And I think if, we, if you use, say, 1985 as your starting point, we're in a completely different world, and Russia is part of it. That doesn't mean that Russia engages this world the same way we do. It doesn't mean that they think about it the same way that we do. But as I, I listed a number of fields, and the list can go on and on and on, uh, we are, uh, Russia isn't separated the same way uh, that the Soviet Union was. And finally, my last point, which I think is really important, the world has changed. And there are, there's a huge agenda that's going to require, in some form, international cooperation on climate, on health. You can go right down the list. And that changes the rules of engagement. Having said that, if you want to, if, if uh, Russian participation means that Russia is going to be just like us, that isn't going to happen. And uh, so we, we also have to be able to be a little bit more flexible in what we understand engagement to mean. Okay. Ken? Yeah, I, much of what, what has just been said, I, I completely agree with. Um, in the diplomatic area, um, one of the successes, it wasn't all that, you know, um, a cup, you know, well regarded at the time, but I think in retrospect, uh, uh, there was something called the Gore Chernomirden, you know, commission, you know, that was set up. And underneath that, we had a whole series of working groups on various subjects, you know, related to US Russian relations, you know, economy, trade, you know, you name it. I think the primary utility uh, of that body. Uh, was to get the bureaucracies talking, you know, to each other. And people knew each other, you know, they were relating to each other. Uh, obviously, uh, as Blair just said, you know, uh, there are differences, you know, but we were aware of the differences and we were communicating. And to me, um, the exchanges, you know, that Jill mentioned are crucial in, you know, in the same, you know, regard. And there are also, you know, many areas, there are many functional areas where cooperation is still, you know, going on today. Um, even though, you know, it's sad to me to see, you know, what, you know, how the Arctic is supposedly getting militarized, but there's an awful lot of very positive scientific cooperation uh, that still goes on through the Arctic Council. Uh, in the fields of medicine, uh, Matt Rojansky, you know, I know, has written on that subject, and there's a good deal, you know, of, I think, cooperation that still goes on. I think there's a lot that still goes on under the radar screen. We know all the laws that have been passed uh, about uh, foreign agents and, and foreign NGOs, but I think that, you know, that when I check into it, you know, there, there's still business things that are going on. There are still, uh, you know, forms of cooperation, you know, that go on. And as a former diplomat, I mean, the, the thing that strikes me the most is how we are not communicating on so many levels that we should be communicating in. Um, we have a habit, you know, of, of sort of indicating, you know, that, uh, that talking, uh, is somehow or another conferring legitimacy on the other party that we're talking to. I don't think that's the case. And we do that also with diplomatic relations. Uh, just because we're talking doesn't mean necessarily that we're agreeing on how the Russians are treating Mr. Navalny or doing a lot of other things. But I hope uh, under, you know, you mentioned uh, Andy, you know, what uh, Angela Stent's book about the resets and the failures, but I still think it would be very beneficial, uh, an outcome beneficial, uh, if the Biden administration would move, you know, to reopen some of these links of dialogue. Uh, I think that would help, at least at the margins, uh, to help sort of prevent us from falling deeper into the morass that we're in right now. <laughs>
Um, can I... Sorry? Quick comment and then we'll go to questions. Okay, quick comment. Well, I think uh, one thing, the starting point of when you start your analysis is very important, what, what, uh, what Blair said. If you start from 1980, you start from 1985, uh, first of all, 1980, nobody was conceiving of what was really going to happen, you know, in just 10 years or in 10 years, 11, 11 years. So uh, overall, the net assessment, I would say, when you look at over 40 years, is very positive. You have a Russia that's far more integrated into the global, into the global system. Uh, unfortunately, I think our policy for the last... Uh, seven years, which has been so focused on punishing Russia and isolating Russia. Isolating Russia is a, uh, uh, is a, uh, it's, it's just, it's not, A, it's not possible, and B, it's ill-considered. Um, the country's too big, it's too important, it's too significant, there are too many things we should be working on, as uh, Ken and uh, Blair, Blair were saying, uh, and you have to have dialogue. It's, it's ludicrous that talking to people confers legitimacy on them. Um, I'm talking to you. Does that mean I think everything you said is right? No, of course not. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, if you, the thing is, a, prob a problem, I think, is that uh, good news is not news. Bad news typically makes, makes news. And so that's what people's, people see. But below the surface for for us that were working there in the 1990s, the program I was running to support scientists and researchers, it was it was kind of crazy. I would I would come back to the states and I would I had met so many you know just brilliant people who were doing fantastic things and had great stories uh, that you know people <laughs> would what are you talking about? What you, you, this doesn't seem to make sense with what we are reading about is going on in Russia. And that is often the often the often the case. I mean, I remember when I went there to, to run the Carnegie Moscow Center for three years shortly after the 1990s. Um, I felt that a lot of the uh, the debates and discussions that took place about Russia in Washington, in particular, simply did not really reflect the country very well that I was living in, and they were poorly informed. And where they were most poorly informed, I think, actually, was on the economic transformation that taking place, and. Uh, and how much of a difference that was that was making? Yeah, you got the big stories about oligarchs, but there were a lot of people. There were a lot of people whose boats were being were being floated and who were doing who were doing well, and were living under much better conditions, even in the 1990s than compared with the 1980s. Uh, I think there was a dramatic a dramatic difference for the better. That's my very very strong and firm belief. Now, how much the United States had to do with it? I think we have to be very careful about uh, overestimating that, and I know that's that's a typical thing we Americans we Americans tend tend to do. Um, you know, it was like the the who lost Russia debate. Well, what Russia was not ours to lose. Russia was not less lost. What happens in Russia is is mainly up to what Russians do, not what we do. We can help at the margins. We can hurt. At, we can we can do more harm actually than we can do good. Uh, unfortunately. Um, but I think we did do a lot of good. You know, we did major things in 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 uh, in opening up transparency and peer selection, in academic uh, academic reviews. I mean, this sounds like I know to to a lay person this will sound like kind of you know mice nuts, but actually it's a very very significant thing. It's it's re it's revolutionary actually. And what we were trying to do, I know, with the MacArthur Foundation was it was revolutionary trying to bring bringing together research and training in Russian universities, which had not been not been the tradition. Uh, I strongly believe then and believe now that I wish we'd focused more on supporting higher education, education more broadly, supporting healthcare more broadly. I think we got too involved in the uh, in the support for in kind of at the high po high political level and in domestic politics in Russia. If we focused more simply on okay, let's do things on the ground that help people directly, then we're going to have a more positive legacy. We're going to be viewed better, and that, that will over time help the relationship. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, we're going to go to uh, the audience questions, but you can submit a question uh, via uh, uh, email at canon at wilsoncenter.org at Twitter at uh, on at, at at Twitter 
and also uh, on our Facebook page. So I'm gonna go with our first question that is from uh, Michelle Rifkin Fish. Uh, and she has a question to uh, Jill and to Blair and about the ways by which um, academic knowledge can circulate in the policy realm. Um, since both of you have dealt with our, our, our have, have dealt with uh, teaching and academic, academia, but also how the academic debate can influence the public debate. That's an interesting question, actually. Um, I have to plug the Wilson Center because obviously the Wilson Center brings uh, academic researchers, um, people with PhDs primarily to come to the United States and do work and fosters communication among academics. So I think that's a very direct way. I know um, in my work at Georgetown, conversely, I have gone and it's, you know, sometimes it's sporadic, but using the internet, I have found a number of academics who are working on exactly the field that I'm interested in, which is young people. And so what is, even though there has been you know, uh, the Putin administration has narrowed the uh, ability for communication and NGOs and, and exchanges, et cetera. It is very easy through the internet to get in touch with the academics in that world. Language might be a factor, but often it is not because many people speak English. And I've had robust conversations and I have used people uh, academics and others in Russia as guest lectures in my class, live Zooms uh, for my students to be able to discuss things. So it's a very different world. I think that's, you know, what Blair has been talking about, this is really true, that it is a different world. And in spite of all the controls that are taking place right now, that Russians are very, um, I don't know, uh, industrious and able to use a lot of tools in ways that sometimes go beyond what Americans do to communicate. So uh, that, I hope that helps to explain, at least in that area, what's going on. Blair. Well, it's interesting that Michelle Rifkin Fish answer, uh, asked this question because she's one of the people I was thinking of who her, her pathbreaking work in the sociology of health um, really has had an impact. Um, I view the relationship between uh, the intellectual community and the policy community as a little bit indirect. I think it changes, uh, academics can change the context. They can change which issues become discussed. Um, I know there are a lot of people in Washington in particular, but also at, at certain public policy schools who really see a kind of one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between what ideas they come up with uh, in their own work and what, and then they could sort of sell it to policymakers. But I, I think overall, it's really much more contextual. And I think that's what the Wilson Center has done. One specific example um, in this area, in the late 1980s, uh, Jeff Hahn at Villanova and a number of other political scientists began to say, you know, we should, we're too concentrated on what happens in Moscow. We should begin to look at what happens in Russian regions and in and, and Soviet regions. And, um, you know, a, 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 there was a pile of work that built up looking at Russian regional politics in particular, but also out, outside of Russia. And by the late 1990s, uh, just in time for Putin to recentralize, it had become uh, sort of, um, uh, gospel that you couldn't just look at Moscow, you had to look more generally. And I think that was, that really reflected a decade or so of research that put light on something that was important um, and didn't necessarily directly aim at policy, but it was really much more changing the atmospherics and context. Can I uh, add to this uh, a, a bit? I, as I spent 15 years in in major think tanks in Washington, the Carnegie Endowment for National Peace and the Center for Strategic International Studies. And three of those years running the Carnegie Moscow Center. So this relationship between policy 
university and academia and analysis is one, uh, it is a very complex, uh, it's very complex. And I think, I think if, when I was a funder, what you think about your, it's important that these, that these, that these people, these scientists, that these academics, social scientists have funding to do their work. Now, when they're, it's harder to predict when there will be the opportunity where that work will be demanded by the actual policy makers. But that, that cannot be predicted so easily. But so I think what you're, what you're, what you want to do is trying to, and trying to kind of influence policy is ensuring that the experts are there and that when there's the demand for them to do something, then they will be in a position to do it. Uh, I think arms control, the arms control field historically has been a good example of that. I think the fear now is that there is, the, the expertise is waning uh, there and you know, actually public awareness is, is waning as well. You know, we're still in virtually the same situation that we were more than 30 years ago with thousands of nuclear warheads on, um, <clears throat> on very, uh, very short alert times, but nobody seems to be aware of it or particularly care about it. Uh, it's kind of a conundrum. Um, I know Bill Perry out at Stanford, last time I spoke with him four years ago, was really working hard on this. But um, it's, um, the relationships have to be there. You have to have people, for example, uh, when there was the, uh, the issue, the United States intervened uh, to deal with the, uh, the Syrian, um, the Russians and the United States worked along with the Chinese actually to, uh, uh, to get rid of the Syrian um, uh, chemical and biological weapons. Um, that was possible because experts had been talking to each other about that very, uh, poss that very possibility. And that kind of dialogue had been supported for a number of years. If that had not been supported, then there would not have been the possibility for those, for the two governments to actually work together and implement a very, very successful project, which unfortunately, because not every chemical or biological weapon was removed from Syria has gotten a real black eye on what was actually a very, very successful program. The Nun Lugar program is also something that hasn't been talked about. I mean, it's the, 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 the most successful story of, uh, of the of US assistance program since the Marshall Plan. And that was a case where for years, there had been funding for these ex experts to get together to talk about, to talk about what they would do in the event that something like like that was necessary. And there it happened, they were ready to do it. Um, I think Ken wanted to jump in here. Um, Andy, thanks very much for mentioning uh, Nun Lugar. Uh, when I was in Moscow, uh, they visited uh, you know, periodically. And to me, that was just a wonderful example of sort of positive congressional input into a very serious issue of the day. Uh, they were incredibly good to work with. I was you know, not working directly with them, but you know, had the opportunity to sit in on briefings and uh, they, they were absolutely uh, remarkable. But I've had the advantage of you know, being in the uh, diplomatic world and then you know, the academic world. And this question of you know, academics being able to influence policy uh, discussions, you know, is a fascinating one. And I, you know, a lot of this is just based on, you know, people with whom I speak. But when I speak, you know, with uh, Russian academics recently, um, they all talk the same story. And that's basically that uh, Putin has a circle of advisors around him and that it's very, very difficult, you know, to break through, you know, that circle of people uh, to give him alternative advice. They just, you know, they just don't seem to be open to it. We have at least the advantage every four years of elections, you know, uh, four, five years ago, the Heritage Foundation, you know, I think gave uh, Donald Trump a lot of his ideas. Uh, and now we've seen, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, people going from, 
uh, the academic world, you know, Bill Burns, you know, becoming CIA director, uh, Toria Newland coming from the, you know, uh, think tank world uh, back to the uh, State Department. I think, you know, it's, it's probably somewhat easier, you know, for our think tankers, uh, you know, to be able to get their ideas before policymakers, particularly, uh, you know, during the run up to the election when, you know, many think tankers are sort of uh, auditioning, you know, for positions, you know, in the new administration. So I, I do think, you know, that that is a real advantage, you know, that we, that we have. Uh, in you know, in getting ideas to policymakers. Thank you, uh, Ken. Um, our next question comes from um, Sir John Scarlett, who is a Wilson Center Global Advisory Council member and served at the British Embassy in 1991 and 1994. And his question is: President Putin seems convinced that the U.S. in particular always tries to undermine Russia. Is this a result of the 1990s experience? How can we best explain this misunderstanding? Randy. When I lived in Moscow, I had a lot of experience working with USAID and others uh, working with Russians to change, to develop policies and to develop practical solutions uh, to problems. And I think we did make some mistakes and we did make some mistakes that left lasting impressions. Um, and one of them is, I think Blair referred to it earlier, is we made certain assumptions that the goal of our efforts was to make Russia look like the United States. Uh, and it, it should not have been. And uh, I recall one experience where I, I had to go into the State Privatization Commission office uh, fairly regularly on behalf of clients. Um, and after after the US government got involved in, in the privatization process, the when you went into the office, you were first greeted by a security guard who is usually a, a veteran of World War II, who was proudly wearing his uniform and his awards, and he would check your documents. Then you would go next to a person from the an American citizen, usually a young person <clears throat> without any experience who would check the same documents. And it was true not just for Americans going in, it was true for everybody. And I think there was a way that that kind of symbolism uh, pervaded a lot of the approach to the advice we gave on, on various fronts and gave a wrong impression of uh, our role and a lasting impression that privatization was something that the Americans were running. Andy and then Ken. Yeah, uh, well, first, I think it's important to, to note that Mr. Putin has evolved a lot over the last 20, now 21 years since he's been in power. Um, he, uh, uh, it, is, it is true, though, that a lot of his whole narrative is based on what happened in the 1990s was bad. It was chaotic. You had oligarchs who assumed too much power. There was state collapse. You can go back to Putin's statement, his so-called millennial statement that he was published uh, in the late December of 1999, just before he was uh, actually named as the, as the successor, so to speak. And these themes are very are very much there, but they're not but they're not as hard as hard edged as they are now. Um, but I think he's uh, so yes. There's the associate the United States with providing bad advice that helped to weaken Russia, and that the United States is trying to weaken Russia. That is that's that's always been there. But if he look he looks at what the United States actually does also. So he looks at the Iraq War. Okay. His advice to George was, George, uh, I don't think this is really a great idea, but you know, there's nothing I can do to stop you. And it was a terrible idea. And it was, a, I think, the biggest foreign policy error in the United States since the Vietnam War. Um, and then Putin looks at, Putin looks at US military interventions uh, uh, that are sometimes, are sometimes described as uh, by the administration itself as an effort to promote democracy. 
Well, I agree with Vladimir Putin that that is a totally erroneous and bad basis for policy. And he looks at, he'll look at what we did in Iraq. He'll look at what we did in Libya. He'll look at what, and then he'll kind of play with what he sees, what he sees in, in Syria. And so there, there are mistakes that we've made, significant ones that have played into his narrative and have hard, hardened his narrative that the United States is causing more instability in the world than, than stability. And you really saw that in the debate about, um, about Syria. Uh, and the Russians, the Russian view at the time was, if you, you know, we, the Obama administration's line was Assad must go, Assad must go, his days are numbered, Assad must go. The, Putin, the Russian position was, if you can explain to us how when Assad goes, that what, what happens afterward is going to be more stable, uh, then, you know, we can sign on to that. But it was impossible. It was impossible to make that ar argument with any kind of credibility uh, that the Russians, the Russians would buy. Um, so I think there are there are elements where uh, I think he's been right about some things. There's a natural proclivity, however, though, for him to kind of you know uh, the default position is the United States is trying to weaken Russia. The United States is trying to undermine Russian interests around around the world, and that he can he can he can interpret certain things that have happened in a certain way that uh, that corroborate that uh, that preconception. Okay, Ken and then Jill. Because I think he's absolutely right. But I wanted to bring in um, another dimension to this. Um, I would go back to the demonstrations, uh, I believe it was in 2012, uh, you know, when uh, uh, Putin and Medvedev changed places and there were massive demonstrations on the street and Putin blamed them on Hillary Clinton. And I, that's something that I think uh, is something that we really need to focus on. I think Putin, you know, clearly has a strong allergy to the color revolutions. Uh, we've seen that, you know, in Georgia, we've seen it in Ukraine, uh, we've seen it, you know, in other places and clearly now, uh, you know, in Belarus. And I, I, I think you know, the, the idea that Putin, you know, whether how much he believes it and how much of it is simply, you know, his determination, you know, to do everything to stay in power. Um, but this idea, you know, that the United States is really after regime change and to change the balance of power, uh, you know, in, 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 you know in, his, in not only Russia, uh, but his neighborhood. Uh, the idea that NATO is still, you know, this uh, uh, nasty, uh, you know, negative, threatening force, the United States, uh, and add in the European Union, which had been, you know, added in after, uh, after Ukraine, this whole image of a sort of a threatening West, uh, which really endangers, you know, Russia, I think really has added a very strong dimension to, you know, the idea of Russia not being treated, you know, as a superpower, uh, all the things that we have talked about. And as I say, I think, you know, we are really dealing, we talked about duality, but we really are talking about different, you know, interpretations of the world. We have such a hard time for good reasons about the Russian interference in our election. Um, you know, all the, uh, the internet, uh, you know, cramming that they are doing. Uh, we have really, you know, it's not just foreign policies, you know, that, you know, that are, are you know, we are not disagreeing on, but it's also, you know, our, our sort of what, we're, what we are each seeing the other do uh, in terms of changing our internal systems. And that has added, you know, a, a very significant element to the mutual distrust. I'll yep. just move in really quickly because Ken stole exactly what I was going to say. But I think if you look at how Putin looks at color revolutions, uh, the Arab Spring, et cetera, uh, he really, I, I think he actually believes that they were engineered by the United States. And I would link that and, and that the next step is to bring down the Putin government and bring down Putin personally. Um, and I think you can link that to the 90s, 
because I do believe that much of the, um, let's say, political unrest, sometimes outright conflict that we see in Ukraine and Georgia right now uh, is the result of kind of this disintegration of the old system during the Soviet Union and trying to rebuild something new without the actual structures, the institutions that might make that, let's say, seamlessly possible. Thank you, Jill. Um, we have several questions dealing with economic policy, and I'm, I'm, I'll try to combine them. Uh, so essentially, people are asking, um, why did Russia fail when other countries have, have faced similar economic catastrophes? Um, but also, I think, to Ken and to Andy, um, so Ken mentioned that, you know, we, we supplied $20 billion with the aid, but it came with great strings attached. Um, so in terms of, of the success of our Russia policy in the 1990s, uh, some said that we just needed to bail out Russia, and others said it would just, the money would just disappear as fast as we put it in. So in terms of our Russia policy in the 1990s, did we lose an opportunity by not going more, offering more economic assistance? Or did we kind of rely on Russia to solve the problems themselves, um, which they had great difficulty doing? Well, ultimately, the Russians were always going to do what they wanted to do. I mean, like loans for shares. Loans for shares was certainly not an idea. The USAID was, was, was uh, trying to uh, promote uh, in Russia. But I think, uh, Will, I think the best opportunity for the United States to, to, possibly, to possibly make a more significant impact um, with a larger infusion of economic assistance, a real infusion, you look at the, that aid package of, of, uh, of Bill Clinton, you look at the aid package that uh, the Bush administration was promoting, that's 20 plus million dollars. It was a lot of, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors, frankly. Uh, we don't go into the whole thing, but it, uh, that's my, that is my view. But the, the, t the moment where we could have influenced things possibly more was between October of 1991 and April of uh, 1992. That was when the reformers really had their strongest uh, political clout and authority uh, in Moscow. And even then it was very tenuous. I mean, Yegor Gaidar was always acting prime minister. He was because he would never get passed by the Duma so they wouldn't even bring him, bring him forward. Um, but the irony is that, okay, at that time, the George H.W. Uh, Bush administration this is, a push, this is an administration that is, in, that is embedded more in a realist approach to international relations and was less inclined to try to intervene domestically in Russia. If the, the Clinton administration afterwards, though, these are more liberal interventionists. Uh, but um, unfortunately, by the time the Clinton administration came to power, the Russian reformers' political clout was already pretty much gone. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, you always play the counterfactual in what could have been or, or what, what possibly could have been. I'm dubious to the extent to which um, we could have made a, a larger, a really a major difference. But if there was a moment, it was around that six month, six month period, and we dilly dallied. Uh, my a good friend and colleague, Anders Oslin, is, is very, very, uh, outspoken on, on this point, but I, I think he's, I think he's ge generally right. Okay, so uh, we have uh, Ken, Blair, and Randy. Yeah, uh, I think I, I would ag again agree with Andy that period, that window, uh, you know, that I described of about eight months, you know, that I saw close. Um, I think there were a couple of factors uh, you know, the George Bush administration, you know, that handled the breakup of the Soviet Union did a very good job, but it was also, you know, a conservative, uh, you know, in terms of economics. And I think, I, as I recall at the time, one of the arguments that I heard about not doing more 
uh, was that you know they they felt unlike Germany after World War II that there wasn't you know the basis you know to do it. There was a lot of talk about a second Marshall Plan you know for Russia, and that never got anywhere because I think the feeling was that we didn't believe that there was the infrastructure there. Yeah, there were there were Gaidar and a few other economists. But you know the Germans, you know, had a you know a, a functioning capitalist economy before the war, and that that substructure simply was not there. Uh, and I think that was one problem. And I agree that if we were going to do something, that was the time that we could have. The other thing, though, is that the Gaidar reforms are often called shock therapy. But you know, when you look at what was done in Poland and some other places, I'm not going to go into any detail. Uh, but they, it wasn't really the shock therapy that was done elsewhere. There were lots of uh, institutional restraints that they were unable to deal with. And you know, when I look at you know, some of the economic failures, um, it's probably because they didn't go far enough. It's like Gorbachev, they didn't go far enough. Uh, you know, they had a vision of what needed to be done and they simply you know, couldn't get it done. And then Yeltsin, I think you know, they, they lost his support as time went on. Remember they had they had the world's worst central banker according yep. to uh, Jeffrey Sachs at the time yep. who was who was printing money like crazy which was I undermining the whole reform. I remember that. Blair and then Randy. Uh, I also think it's important to go back to a couple of points Andy made uh, early on. The uh, the Soviet economy was uh, had become. Uh, overly dependent on oil prices and its ability to succeed uh, fluctuated with, with oil prices. Uh, there also was an, a moment when there was an opportunity to begin to innovate in the Soviet economy with the kosygin lieberman uh, reforms, which were passed over so that when you get to the 1980s, uh, you know, you had a Soviet economy that was making the best black and white televisions ever made, but couldn't make colored televisions. It, it was an economy that the feedback mechanisms were totally broken, so it couldn't innovate. And then you have a resurgent liberal capitalism uh, touched off by Thatcher and Reagan. Uh, you have the, the, the falling uh, oil prices. And you had the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution, which transforms economies from industry to information. And they didn't have the institutional structures to make that transition. Then you come along with all, all that everybody else was saying, but I think there are, there are deeper reasons for the Soviet economic collapse and nothing was inevitable, but the Soviet Union wasn't positioned uh, to move into this new world. And, there's a brand new book out on uh, the transformation of New York from uh, where it was sad shape in the mid 1970s to pre COVID. And it's a story of New York basically throwing away its old economy and embracing a new economy at terrible human cost. But it put New York on a different path. The Soviet Union never entered that separate path and therefore has had difficulty adjusting uh, to dramatic world changes in the economy. <clears throat> I'm not totally sure more money poured in from the United States, even in the early years, would have made a difference because I think there, there was just a, a, the end of the Soviet Union was a collapse of a very well-developed, well-entrenched bureaucracy, but the, a bureaucracy that cr had the institutions that kept the country uh, running, including, by the way, the the large en state enterprise that both Jill and Andy referred to earlier, that maintained health, maintained vacations, maintained uh, basic rights for the workers that uh, work there. Those all suddenly ended, and the government was replaced by Yeltsin, who had uh, a mixed background, you could say, and then a lot of young economists and young economists with little experience, maybe the most political experience they had was being in the comfortable, but they were not prepared to run a government and not prepared to manage huge amounts of money that would come from the United States, no matter how strong, how good their intentions were. 
And I think it's something I would like to note about the 90s is that <clears throat> Russia succeeded. Some, it, it, it happened suddenly. We keep talking about this flag going down and the other one going up. It almost literally happened like that. And there were just huge gaps in the way to run a society that had to be filled and had to be filled immediately, if not soon after immediately. And it was a problem everybody faced. And I think many people among the reformers did their absolute best to make it happen, but they had to, to create, create something from something that didn't fit them anymore. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our discussion on our first panel, but again, I want to remind everybody that uh, there's going to be a second panel tomorrow, uh, and we will feature the Russian experience of the 1990s, and we'll kind of get their, we will get their interpretation, their experiences, and their reactions as to the influence of the US and European policy. Um, in the, I apologize to everyone whose question that I did not get to, but I will um, try to give you uh, 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 an advanced place tomorrow if you have a question for our Russian colleagues. That's but our I, fault. I guess my, too much. Uh, no, no it, it's been a very informative discussion and conversation. That's what we wanted. Um, I have one last question, though. Um, Putin um, is the ultimate beneficiary of the 1990s. Uh, he would not be president of Russia. He would not have achieved his wealth and prominence if not for the reforms of the 1990s, and yet he consistently runs against the 1990s. So how do you explain this paradox? Uh, does he yearn for the old Soviet period, or uh, is he just simply not grateful uh, for the opportunities that Yeltsin and the 1990s presented him? Any takers? Sure. Look, you know, there was a great song that came out, I think, in 2001, A Man Like Putin. It was very popular in Russia. If it hadn't been Putin, it would have been someone else like Putin. Um, I mean, who was Mr. Putin before he was the president of Russia? Uh, I remember, I think, uh, Fiona Hill describing him on a panel at the Brookings, <laughs> this is 20, 21 years ago, as a cipher. Uh, he, he answered to what was a demand. Uh, even the liberal reformers like Chubias and others, you know, I think realized at the end of the 1990s that the state, the collapse of the state really was a problem. There did need to be more order. Uh, there did need to be some kind of consolidation. Um, of course, you know, the return of state power has been, you know, it swung way far in the, you know, the, the pendulum has swung way far in the direction of uh, consolidation of state power, or at least the appearance thereof. Um, that's not gonna last forever. Uh, <laughs> although I wouldn't, I remember again, my friend Anders, every, he started predicting the fall of Putin, I think in 2003. And I, and I would joke, you know, if, if I had a dollar for every time someone told me that Mr. Putin's days are numbered, he's going to be out of power in the next year, I'd be a very wealthy guy and I'd be so, doing something, something, something different. So Putin filled a, I think a public demand that existed from the experience, the zeitgeist, if you will, of the 1990s. Um, and it works for him politically. Uh, you know, it's been a, just a very effective go-to for him. Um, you know, but it, it did look like uh, uh, it was running out in 2011 and 2012, that people were, ti were tired of him. But, you know, then he worked the, he shifted his authority from the guy who brought stability and economic growth to the guy that brought Russia back and as a major power with uh, Crimea and Nash. And he sort of he sort of switched where he got his authority from, a little bit less though from the the the, the, the narrative of the 1990s, but part of the narrative. But the other part where Russia was you know a, a disrespected power and now it's a respect a respected power. He's a 
he's a much more effective politician than anybody ever expected. Certainly that Mr. Mr. Berezovsky, for example, <laughs> who uh, ended up on the wrong side of that relationship, he's been a very effective politician. I know it's hard for Americans to kind of accept that it takes political skills to operate in an authoritarian political framework, but it does. And, you know, the guys, it's worked, it's worked for him. So why would he change? We have about 30 seconds, so anyone want a last word? Ken, last word is yours. Just simply that um, I think we've seen in our own country how forces, you know, uh, beneath the surface that we may not appreciate, you know, can uh, come to bear with a very clever politician, uh, the, our president uh, in the previous term. Uh, there's certain, I think, an analogy, uh, you know, of a very clever individual you know, who took advantage of underlying trends, Putin in the 90s, the dislocation of Russia and Trump, you know, make America great again, you know, the middle class is getting, you know, bottomed out. I think there's some very interesting similarities there about how we have perhaps uh, underestimated uh, the political skills, uh, mostly for ill uh, of, of these two people. So Ken, you get the final word. Um, I want to thank all our participants uh, for a fascinating discussion. Again, we're going to continue our discussion tomorrow from the Russian perspective. Uh, but I want to thank my the, the audience for their patience, uh, for staying through to the end. I know we, we had a little technical problem at the beginning, but uh, it was well worth uh, listening to our commentators and our speakers today. So thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Tune in to the same bat channel tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs>